Good evening, everyone. If you would wish to move down a little bit closer to the front, you might actually stay a little bit warmer. I apologize, it's kind of cold in here. Um, it's like they turn on the air conditioning the moment that it gets remotely nice outside. Um, but anyway, good evening. Welcome to Target Free Thursday Night at the Walker. I'm Sarah Peters. I'm the Assistant Director of Public Programs here in the Education Department. And I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, tonight's talk is the second to last in a series of programs around our exhibition, Kara Walker, My Compliment, My Enemy, My Oppressor, My Love. And um, it is currently on view upstairs in galleries four, five, and six. Um, and it will, it's up for a few more weeks. And so if you haven't been to see it, then this is the moment where I lecture you and tell you to go um, because your, your time is running out. And it's a big and beautiful show and um, there's a lot to digest. So I suggest going now because um, it, 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 it inspires us a return um, for a little bit more time. Um, so in these programs over the past couple of weeks, we've looked at a lot of things. We've talked about history and sexual politics and literature, um, Aunt Jemima, Don Imus, all kinds of topics. And um, it's built up to be quite a remarkable curriculum around Kara Walker's work, most of which is accessible on the Walker channel. The Walker channel is a section of our website where we post archived webcasts that are available as video downloads or sound files where you can go and watch past lectures um, that you couldn't attend or ones that you want to revisit. And I mention that because this program is one of them. We are streaming live on the web right now. Um, and so you can go and watch this program over and over again. Uh, and that also means that when we get to the Q&A session at the end, I ask that you use the two microphones that the ushers will have in the aisles to ask your questions so that our web listeners can hear your voices. Um, the final lecture in this series is next week, May 3rd, and is poet Kevin Young, who also um, was a contributor to the exhibition catalog. He will be giving a poetry reading and a talk on his writing on um, Kara Walker's use of written language in her work. But for tonight, our topic is humor, as you can see. Um, and that affords me probably the only opportunity that I will ever have to stand up here doing a program introduction and tell knock-knock jokes. But I'm not going to do that, mostly because I don't know any good ones, but also because um, Kara Walker's humor is, is actually rather serious. Um, it is humor that pokes at uncomfortable subjects and humor that makes us laugh because we're uneasy or maybe embarrassed. And on the contrary, maybe it's humor that makes us uneasy or embarrassed because we did laugh at imagery that part of us knows isn't really funny. And why does this happen? What, what is it about bodily functions and stereotypical representations of race and gender jokes that we find comical? And, and why do they sometimes not seem funny? Um, and perhaps more importantly, what are the ethical limits of these interactions? The answers to these kind of questions can be found in philosophy, of course. And we are fortunate tonight to have Simon Critchley here to help us navigate some of this territory. Simon is a professor of philosophy at the New School for Social Research in New York and has been sunning himself this past year in Los Angeles as a fellow at the Getty Research Institute. He specializes in modern continental philosophy, phenomenology, psychoanalysis, and the ethical and the political. In his numerous writers and lectures, he has taken on topics such as nihilism, the meaning of life, and the nature of moral responsibility and political action. But it is his writings on humor that bring him to the stage tonight. In his 2002 book on the subject, Critchley gives the reader a breakdown of the ways that humor has appeared in philosophical thought and allows us a way into thinking about why and how funny things are actually funny. In this text, I found one passage to be particularly striking in thinking about Kara Walker's work. In a discussion about the universal versus the particular in humor, Critchley argues that humor is ultimately local, that it requires culturally specific common ground in order to be understood or properly translated, and that in this centering in the local, humor brings us back to ourselves. He writes, quote, if humor tells you something about who you are, then it might be a reminder that you are perhaps not the person you would like to be, end quote. 
And I think this is the danger and the brilliance of Walker's work. It provides a space where viewers are confronted by all of who they are, because some version of themselves is up on the wall, whether it is the part of you that is a master, a compliment, an enemy, or a lover. It's all there, and you can't really ignore it if you choose to look carefully. Phrased in perhaps a slightly more upbeat tone, Critchley also writes that, quote, humor is an exemplary practice because it is a universal human activity that invites us to become philosophical spectators of our own lives, end quote. I would like to say that art does this too, but that might be a bit too optimistic. At the very least, some artists succeed at it better, better than others, and I think that Kara Walker is one of them, evidenced by the reason that we are all here tonight. By making work, work that bravely invites us into this realm of analysis, we might just come out at the other end with a better understanding of ourselves, which just might lead to a better understanding of the world. But I'll leave that up to Simon to figure out and whatever happens up here on this overhead projector. So please welcome Simon Critchley. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. That's Lovely introduction. And the idea that um, humour reminds us that we're people that we'd rather not be is a thing that I'll come back to. Um, so thank you for the invitation. Delighted to be here. First trip to Minneapolis. And uh, some of what I say will be in continuity with some of the things you'll find in the, in the catalogue essays, particularly the essays by Philip Verne and, uh, and Kathy Harbreich. Jokes are like small anthropological essays. If one of the tasks of the anthropologist is to revise and relativize the categories of Western culture by bumping them up against cultures other, uh, hitherto adjudged exotic or other, then we might say that anthropology shares with humor the basic strategy of defamiliarization. Common sense is disrupted, the unexpected is evoked, familiar subjects are situated in unfamiliar, even shocking contexts, in order to make the, the, the audience or readership conscious of their own assumptions and prejudices. Anthropologists are akin to comedians, tricksters, clowns or jesters. And humour, in my view, is a form of critical social anthropology. It defamiliarizes the familiar, demythologizes the exotic, and inverts the world of common sense. So humor views the world awry. It brings us back to the everyday by estranging us from it. And this is what I mean when I claim elsewhere that humor provides what I call an oblique phenomenology of ordinary life. It's an indirect description of our life in the world, which is what some of us would think is the task of philosophy, which is what makes humour such an exemplary practice. So humour is a practice, is something that we do that gives us an alien perspective on our practices. It gives us an alien perspective on the things that we do. It lets us view the world as if we just landed from another planet. The comedian is the anthropologist of our humdrum everyday lives. And so is the comic artist. And I think Kara Walker is a first-rate critical social anthropologist. Any study of humour, like anthropology, requires context. It requires fieldwork. It requires research. And finally, it's only as good as its examples. And what makes humour both so fascinating and so tricky to think about and to write about, it's a very difficult topic to write about, is the way in which the examples continually exceed the analysis one is able to give of them. They say more in saying less. And we certainly don't require a philosophical theory of humour in order to understand what's at stake in humour. Again, that's what interests me, it's what draws me to the topic. You don't need a philosopher to explain what's going on in humour, you understand it already. I printed this out on purpose on rather elaborate Getty paper, which is uh, proving slippery, but let's see. I normally use cheap A4. 
In my view, the lesson to be drawn from anthropology is the humility of a certain cultural relativism as a strategy aimed at combating the intolerance and racism of Western ethnocentrism. Now, is the same true of humour? Your sense of humour um, may not be the same as mine. I hope it isn't the same as mine. Mine is extremely filthy. But does the study of humour lead us to embrace cultural relativism, that big, bad bogeyman of Western culture? Can we legislate for humour like philosopher kings, coming up with general laws about what is permitted and what is, might not be permitted? If you read some of the debates that followed up on that rather uh, predictable Imus affair, um, I remember reading one op-ed in the New York Times which simply wanted to prohibit laughter at certain things, as if you could formulate, as it were, a general principle that would just prohibit certain forms of laughter. <laughs> and that's an understandable response. It's, well, we'll come back to that. But this question of the relativity of humour is a really interesting one. And this is what, what Sarah said already, the relationship between the universal and the particular. Now, most studies of humour, of comedy, of jokes, uh, usually begin by claiming that humour is universal. Uh, apparently there have never been cultures that didn't have some form of laughter, some form of humour, although the varieties and intensities of that laughter vary dramatically. There's a quotation I rather like from Mary Douglas, who was an important anthropologist at University College London. She writes, um, We know that some tribes are said to be dour and unlaughing, others laugh easily. Pygmies lie on the ground and kick their legs in the air, panting and shaking in paroxysms of laughter. Right? This is not true of Swedes or Norwegians, right? This is not, in a sense, the, 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 the fact that the way in which one laughs depends upon... So everyone laughs, but the way in which one laughs is very, very particular. Now, to say that humour is universal is, of course, to say almost nothing or very little. All cultures laugh, just as all cultures have a language, and most of them seem to have uh, some sort of religious practice, usually involving a belief in a hidden metaphysical reality and usually involving a belief in the afterlife. So what? The fact that all cultures laugh might be a formal universal truth of the same order as admitting that all human beings eat, sleep, breathe and take a shit once a day, maybe even more than once, which is even true of Queen Elizabeth II, although I don't know if she goes more than once. But it tells us nothing at the level of concrete context. And that's where the matters, matters begin to get really sticky, smelly and interesting. Humour is all about context and thick context. Diogenes the cynic was asked how he would like to be buried. He replied, face down. And I think Kara, Worker's, Kara Walker's work buries us face down in our own historical shit when we look at it, and we do not smell good when we look at it. And that's what interests me. So humour, as Sarah said, is local, and any sense of humour, any understanding of humour is highly context-specific. Anyone who's tried to render what they believe to be a hugely funny joke in a foreign language will understand what I mean. You, you, you try and translate it, and you fail. This happened to me last weekend with a French friend in LA. And as usual, it was a joke about about bears. I particularly like jokes about bears. Very difficult to translate. Now, although um, various forms of nonverbal humour can travel across, nonverbal humour can travel across um, linguistic frontiers. Uh, a famous exa example is uh, if we think about mime, uh, the, the, the success of Commedia dell'arte uh, throughout Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries. Or if we think about the success of certain forms of mime and silent comedy, such as Chaplin or uh, Monsieur Hulot or Mr. Bean. There is something translatable from one con context to another about nonverbal humour. But verbal humour is notoriously recalcitrant to translation. The speed and brevity of wit can become tiresome and prolix in another tongue. And a joke explained is a joke killed. In 1921, Paul Valéry noted, humour is untranslatable. 
If this was not the case, then the French would not use the word. And we'll come back to this question of what the, the French mean by humour. But if Valérie is right, and the French use humour because it's untranslatable, then might it not be the very untranslatability of humour that somehow compels us? Is, the, is it the untranslatability of humour that draws us in? Might not its attraction reside in the fact that it cannot be explained to others, and that humorous savoir-faire always contains a certain je ne sais quoi? Humour, then, is a form of cultural insider knowledge, and might indeed be said to function like a linguistic defence mechanism. The untranslatability of humour gives native speakers a palpable sense of their distinctiveness and superiority. You know, no one understands our jokes, therefore they're, they're stupid. In this sense, having a common sense of humour is like sharing a secret, often uh, an obscene secret code. Indeed, is this not the experience of meeting a compatriot um, on vacation in an otherwise unfamiliar environment at a conference or whatever, where the rapidity of one's contact and one's intimacy is in direct proportion to both uh, a common sense of humour and a common sense of humour's exclusivity. If you think about if you're two people from the same place in an alien environment, you bond together around jokes often. So we wear our cultural distinctiveness like an insulation layer against the surrounding alien environments. It warms us up when everything is alien and cold and unfamiliar. Now, I've argued elsewhere in this book on humour that humour returns us to our physicality, it returns us to the body, and it returns us to the animal quality of that body. But as Sarah says, it, it also returns us to locality. It returns us to a specific... Here comes the technological part a specific and circumscribed ethos. Now, um, so humour takes us back to the place that we're from. Whether that's the concreteness of a neighbourhood, the abstraction of a nation state, or whatever. The word ethos must be understood in its ancient Greek sense. It has a number of meanings. It means both custom, and place, but it also means character and disposition. A sense of humour is often what connects us most strongly to a specific place and leads us to predicate certain characteristics of that place. A certain, assigning certain dispositions and customs to its inhabitants. And the sweet melancholy of exile is often rooted in nostalgia for a lost sense of humour. For example, as a voluntary exile from England, which is a dreadful place in nearly all respects, what I really miss is humour, in particular absurd and extremely obscene humour the shared effortless sense of the funny that one can share with another cultural insider without fear of causing offence. I think the joy of humour is that, and that's also, there's a menacing flip side to that. I think that's also where the logic of ethnic humour really kicks in. So humour is about ethos. It's about place, locality, custom, and the character and disposition of the people that live in that place. There's another further link to be made here between ethos and um, ethnos. I'll put these both up. Ethos and ethnos, in the sense of a people, a tribe, a social group, or in the modern world, a nation state. In relation to humour, this is often vaguely expressed in two ways. Firstly, um, foreigners do not have a sense of humour and secondly they're not funny right? now recall that George Orwell famously said that the British Empire was based on two fundamental beliefs 
the first belief is that nothing ever changes. The second belief is foreigners are funny. In ethnic humour, the eth and, and in many ways, the, the logic of most imperial cultures works like that. Uh, we are who we are. Nothing's ever going to change the way we are. Our hegemony is without end. And people that are not like us are funny people. Is that extendable to the present context here in the United States? We could discuss that. In ethnic humour, the ethos of a place is expressed by laughing at people who are not like us and usually believed to be either excessively stupid or peculiarly canny or clever. And this is, a, if you look at, there's a lot of um, very tedious research on this topic, but if you look at ethnic humour in particular, uh, it seems to fall into two categories. It's about laughing at someone who's not like us, and the person who's not like us is not like us in two respects. They're either A, stupid, or B, clever. So their otherness is dependent upon stupidity or cleverness. Let's take some examples. In England, the Irish are traditionally described as stupid, the Scots as canny. In Canada, the Newfies and the Nova Scotians assume these roles. In Finland, the Karelians are deemed stupid and the Lions clever. In India, the Sikhs and the Gujaratis assume these places. In the US, it's for you to say it, Mexicans or blacks who are deemed stupid. I don't know who you find clever. Um, <laughs> Brits. Brits or Jews, um, British Jews in particular. <laughs> really hard time. Um, how does Jewish humour, how does anti-Semitic humour work? It works by the Jew being an outsider because they're suspiciously clever. Right? It's not the outsider as stupid, it's the outsider as canny. And that's usually run together with the idea of being uh, miserly, mean and money obsessed. And this is also the way in which, say, uh, traditional English jokes against the Scots play out. The Scots are notoriously mean and clever. Right? So that the, there's the, that logic of um, outsider as stupid, outsider as clever. But as stupid or clever, the belief is that they are inferior to us, or at least somehow disadvantaged because they are not like us. And this is the, the menacing flip side of a belief in the untranslatability and exclusivity of humour. So that cultural insulation layer you, you wear when you move around the world, is also there's also a very menacing aspect to that. The facts of ethnic humour are all too well known. In the European context, of which I'm more familiar, the French laugh at the Belgians, the Belgians laugh at the Dutch, and the Dutch laugh right back. The Danes laugh at the Swedes, the Swedes laugh at the Finns, and the Finns laugh right back. The Scots laugh at the English, and the English laugh at the Irish, and the Irish laugh right back. The Germans laugh at the Ostfrieslanders, and everyone else laughs rather nervously at the Germans. <laughs> In relation to humour, the Germans are obviously a special case. And much could be said about anti-German jokes, whose history stretches back at least 200 years. A case that was obviously not helped over much by the events of the last century. German humour is no laughing matter. Ted Cohen relates a splendidly objectionable joke. It's a beautiful joke. This is it. The thing about German food is that no matter how, how much you eat, an hour later you're hungry for power. Now, this qualifies as what Cohen calls a meta-joke. Right? It's, it's, it's a meta-joke, where the condition for the joke is the fact that you already know the joke about Chinese food. Right? The joke about Chinese food invariably leaving one hungry as, as soon as one's eaten it, or an hour after eating it. So therefore, this is not just a joke, but a joke upon a joke. Therefore, a meta-joke. And often the best jokes have that form. The best jokes are ones where you use the form of the joke and play with it. As a hypothesis, uh, I'd say that much of the humour in Kara Walker's art is a series of visual meta-jokes. Visual meta-jokes of plays upon form that critically assess, uh, sorry, critically address our usual comic reactions. So that the laughter sticks in our throats, but I'll come back to that. 
So another way that the meta joke works is that by being a joke upon the joke, we laugh, but in a sense the laughter sticks in our throats because we're aware of the form of the joke and we're aware of that menacing flip side to, to humour. Uh, I could say more about the Germans, but I, I won't. It's, it would be a, a lecture on its own. But it's a fascinating topic because the uniqueness of the Germans, the German case, uh, is that for, for at least the last 200 years, if you look at German literature, uh, the Germans have internalised the sense of themselves not having a sense of humour. So the way in which the logic of ethnic humour normally works is that foreigners are, don't have a sense of humour and are in themselves funny, but no one believes themselves unfunny. Whereas the Germans have this problem with humour, which is if you go back to Jean Paul and elsewhere, you find it all over the place. Anyway, the intimate connection between ethnicity and ethnicity, between these two terms, ethos, custom, place, disposition, character, and ethnos, people, tribe, uh, must be recognised and not simply sidestepped. Ethnic humour is very much the humour of what we can call superiority. Let me just back up and for a second. I want to say something general here. And I love this overhead projector. This is a great piece of technology. Yes, my writing, my writing is it's semi-legible. I'll just... Um, there are three main theories of humour. Oh no, three main theories of the comic, let's say. Um, superiority, relief and incongruity. The superiority theory is very simple. It would, uh, let me give you an example. Someone comes into the lecture late, they fall down the stairs, we laugh at them. Right? We feel superior to them in their pratfall, in, in their folly. And that's why for most of the intellectual tradition of the, the West uh, and the philosophical tradition, humour has, has been discouraged. It's vulgar. Why? Because we feel a momentary superiority over our fellow human beings. So, for example, in, um, uh, in Plato, Plato's Republic, the guardians of the city were not meant to laugh. And you find that repeated, for example, say, in early monasticism, in early Christian monasticism. Uh, initially, monks were not allowed to laugh. Then they were allowed to laugh under certain conditions. And are you allowed to laugh by showing your teeth? That's another key thing. At what point the bearing of teeth becomes possible, which is both a function of dentistry and a function of uh, animality. Because the animal, when it... Uh, the animal reveals its teeth in a, in a moment of aggression. So in a sense, um, this is another separate lecture, how one laughs and how it is, uh, how one laughs in a non-vulgar way. This, anyway, I could go on about this for, for, for hours. But the first theory that goes right the way through the um, Western tradition is that laughter is suspicious because we feel superior to others. The second theory is the relief theory. The relief theory is the idea that comedy provides relief, a relief and a release of energy. And you find this theory most famously in, uh, in Freud. In Freud, uh, there's like a, a certain level of energy in the human body, which is bound up by repression, and laughter allows us to expend that in certain ways. So what we're doing in laughter is we're experiencing a relief and a release of energy. That's the second, second theory. Uh, I'll come back to that in a, uh, towards the end of the lecture. The third theory is the incongruity theory. The incongruity theory is the idea that the essence of humour consists in uh, a mismatch between what we expect to be the case and what actually happens in the joke. So the way jokes work is by uh, defeating our expectations. Right? So uh, I mean, there are millions of examples, but a favourite example of mine is the, um, is the following. Is that when in, in uh, football stadiums or indeed in uh, baseball stadiums, I saw them do this at the, uh, the Dodgers stadium when I was with my son a couple of weeks ago, when people stand up and they, that, that we call that a Mexican wave, you call the wave, the wave. The wave. Yeah, that's interesting, that's interesting. We call that a Mexican wave because it was first seen in the, the, the World Cup, football World Cup in Mexico, whereas here that could be even seen as a, an ethnic slur, that's interesting. 
The wave, okay. Um, the joke is the following. Uh, did you see me at Princess Diana's funeral? No, I was the one that started the Mexican wave. Or I was the one that started the wave. Now, that joke is, is, is a lovely example of incongruity because um, there was no wave at Princess Diana's funeral. But if you lived through that, on the edges of that, you could have imagined it happening. And you could have imagined uh, a wave going down uh, the mall and then the various members of the House of Windsor, all 42 of them, <laughs> Hanoverian rats uh, outside watching the cortege. They'd have to take part and that would wave would then follow. So it's a joke. I mean, the best jokes are jokes which are incongruous but are playing with something that would be at least imaginable in reality. Right? So those are the three main theories. Superiority, relief, incongruity. Um, it's incongruity which is the most interesting. Let me just go back to my main topic. It's a curious fact that much humour, particularly when one uh, thinks of the European context, is powerfully connected to perceived but curiously outdated national styles and national differences. There is something deeply anachronistic about humour. Um, there's something, for example, there was, to go back to the Germans, there was a a poll done in the Netherlands, let's say 25 years ago, uh, about the attitudes of the Dutch towards the Germans. And if you know anything about this, this context, this is, a, this is a, a context with a lot of bad smells. And it revealed that there were strong prejudices, prejudices amongst many Dutch people against Germans. So the Dutch government spent a lot of money and energy on transforming the opinions of uh, the Germans, the image of the Germans in the Netherlands. Ten years later, they took another poll and it was even worse. Right? The reputation of the Germans was even worse. Now, what that reveals is something quite interesting. The fact that there is something anachronistic about what we laugh at. What we're laughing at is something generations old. It's outdated uh, national styles, national differences. It's a past whose uh, place in the present is very, very nostalgic, almost mythical. And um, I find that Interesting, you know, the, 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 uh, the topic of national differences is a topic you get onto very quickly with humour. And I find that a, a thick and difficult and unpleasant and interesting topic. But if we stay with the idea of um, anachronism, there is something outdated about what we, what we laugh at. Again, I want to think about that in relation to Kara Walker's work. Because it's the anachronism of the imagery which is interesting, I think. What, what is it about this... Um, curiously anachronistic antebellum world of plantation slavery. She returns us to a world that some Americans in defending the Confederate flag would call, it's a curious word, heritage, and others would simply want to leave behind or disavow. So one's relationship to that antebellum world is one of, say, heritage or disavow. Now, both responses, I think, are mistaken. And Kara Walker's art shows us that mistake. She shows us the obscenity of the past, the obscenity of that past, and the way in which that obscenity snags at what we might grandly call American being. It snags at what it means to be an American. The fact of slavery is the obscene secret at the heart of what it means to be American. And that obscene secret is something we can either redescribe as heritage or disavow, but both those responses fail to, to, to get a grip on it. Let me turn now to the, the history of humour, and uh, you'll see why soon. I'll just, my greasy paper here, this is. Right. <clears throat> Where does humour begin? Humour, um, if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, which should never be trusted on uh, on the basis of, uh, for its etymologies, because they're largely speculative. But the Oxford English Dictionary says that the first recorded use of the word humour to indicate something amusing or jocular is in 1682. 1682. This is not to say that there was nothing funny before 1682, <laughs> but rather that the association of the word humour with the comic and the jocular is an innovation that belongs to a specific time a specific place. And that's very interesting. It's the specific time is the late 17th century. The specific place is England. 
and the English language, which is simultaneous, of course, with the establishment of slave-based English colonies in the Americas, in Georgia, and the Carolinas, and the acceleration, the massive acceleration of the Atlantic slave trade. Is that a coincidence? I don't know. It's certainly historically contiguous, and that's interesting. Um, and it gets worse in a second, you'll see what I mean. Prior to the late 17th century, humour signified a mental disposition. It signified a temperament or a disposition. As, for example, in Ben Jonson's Every Man in His Humour from 1598. The earlier meaning of humour derived from the ancient Greek medical doctrine of the four humours, or uh, the four fluids that make up and regulate the body, the blood, the phlegm, the bile, and the black bile. The black bile is the melancholia. The melancholia. So another very uh, strong link that goes back all the way to the, the Greeks, but uh, takes on different aspects in different periods of history, is the link between humour and melancholy. Breton, in um, his anthology of, uh, let's do it in the French title. Le Mot Noir. Breton, in his uh, anthology of Humo Noir, um, uh, makes this link between, uh, between humour and melancholy. Humo Noir, what does one make of that term? Um, firstly, it is an uh, invention of, in 1939, 1940, Breton first uses that term, and it's a retrospective term. It's a term that's used to describe a tradition which already exists. To that extent, it's like film noir. I mean, film noir is a term used by what a bunch of French filmmakers uh, rebelling against the tradition of classical French cinema, looking at the Hollywood movies of the 40s, Orson Welles, Billy Wilder, and uh, inventing this category of film noir. Humour noir is, is like that. And if you look at uh, the notion of, the, of Breton's anthology of humour noir, he uses it to describe or to reinvent a tradition that goes back through Kafka. It's a very important thing. I mean, Kafka uh, has to be understood as, as, a, as a, an example of humour noir, and back to the 18th century. And the first entries in the anthology de l'humour noir are on Jonathan Swift and the Marquis de Sade. And uh, I'll come back to Swift in a second. So, the association of humour with the comic and with the jocular is modern. It's late 17th century. It arises in the period of the rise of the modern nation state. In particular, the astonishing rise of Britain as a trading, colonizing, slaving, and warring nation after the establishment of constitutional monarchy in the glorious revolution, so-called, of 1689. 1689, first usage of humor, 1682. And this dating is confirmed if we turn to the first theorist of humor. The first theorist of humour is um, Shaftesbury. Anthony Ashley Cooper, third Earl of Shaftesbury. In 1709, Shaftesbury writes uh, a treatise called Census, Census Communis, an essay on the freedom of wit and humour. Oh my God, my writing is so bad. Census communis. Seventeen oh nine, Shaftesbury. Shaftesbury was a pupil of John Locke. Um, he saw humour as the expression of common sense. Census communis. But rather than understanding it simply as common sense, census communis is more of a shared public sensibility, a moral feeling. 
in the life of, in the life of a free society, or rather, humour is essential for Char and Shaftesbury's view to the life of a free society. In particular, the ability to laugh at the so-called truths of religion. For Shaftesbury, that's a, an essential feature. So what we see in, uh, in Shaftesbury is the first theory of humour as being something essential to the life of a free, liberal society. But going back to that contiguity between the history of humour and the history of slavery, it's very interesting uh, and not so funny that Shaftesbury was also a key figure in the establishment of the colonies in the Carolinas. And together with Locke, Shaftesbury drafted the fundamental constitutions of the Carolinas in 1669, which was, a, if, you've, if you have a chance to read it, is a very feudal and restricted document for such champions of freedom. So again, making that link between uh, the rise of humour and uh, historical processes, one could maybe push that a bit further. Shaftesbury and Locke are characters who weren't exactly uh, politically neutral. The modernity of humour, to go back to that theme, is also something apparent in French accounts of the origin of the concept. Although the English word humour is originally a French borrowing from the Anglo-Norman humour and the old French humour, it is curious to note that French dictionaries claim that the modern sense of humour is an English borrowing. For example, in the Dictionnaire de l'Académie Française, uh, it says, humour is a word borrowed from English, a word borrowed from English, a form of irony at once pleasant and serious, sentimental and satirical, that appears to belong particularly to the English spirit, l'esprit anglais. So we have the dictionary of the French Academy claiming that there's something specifically English about humour. And if you look at French authors of that period in the 18th century, with the exception of Voltaire, and right through into the 19th century, there's this identification of humour with the English. Now, if you go to another key text from this period, from the 18th century, the, uh, the encyclopedia, the first encyclopedia of Diderot and d'Alembert. Which way are we going to go now? We're going to go this way. I should mention Diderot. The Encyclopédie. Um, Diderot died eating an apricot. I note. Um, I've just written a book about how philosophers die, which is... Uh, it's actually true. <laughs> um, anyway, in the Encyclopédie, there is an article on humour. It's very interesting. It's very short. I'll read it to you. Uh, and it's written by Diderot. And Diderot writes, humour. The English use this word to designate an original, uncommon, and singular pleasantry. Amongst the authors of that nation, no one possesses humour uh, to a higher degree than Jonathan Swift. By the force of which he is able to give to his pleasantries, Swift brings about effects amongst his compatriots that one would never expect from the most serious and well-argued works. Thus it is, in advising the English to eat little Irish children with their cauliflowers, Swift was able to hold back the English government, which was otherwise ready to remove the last means of sustenance and commerce from the Irish people. This pamphlet has the title, A Modest Proposal. End of quote. Now, we should note here that the, the exemplary place of Jonathan Swift in the history of humour, uh, what uh, Diderot calls uh, le plus haut point, the highest point of English humour. And this is something continued by Breton in his anthology of Humour Noir. He begins the anthology with Swift, with Swift's modest proposal. Or again, we could think about the, the last two books of uh, Gulliver's Travels, the two books that you don't give to the children. Breton claims Swift as the true initiator of humour noir, as the inventor of what he calls la plaisanterie féroce et funèbre, ferocious and funereal pleasantry. I think what we're interested in here is ferocious and funereal pleasantry. I think it's also what's going on in Kara Walker's work. Now, the question of ethnicity returns here in a very curious and paradoxical way. Because in order to de define humour as something essential to the English spirit or English mind, and then to give Swift as the highest example of English humour is, to say the least, paradoxical. Jonathan Swift was not exactly English. As Samuel Beckett replied, 
When he was asked by an American journalist whether he was English, he replied, au contraire. The same reply might also apply to Swift, Stern, Wilde, Joyce, and the many other Irish contraries to Englishness. So there's an interesting you know, uh, question here about Anglo-Irish relationships insofar as they figure in the history of humour. It's a fascinating topic. And what it is to, uh, what it is for Irish authors to inhabit this language and to, um, if you like, strike back against the empire with, with humour, with very dark humour. But if Irishness is the contrary to Englishness, then it's important to point out that this is an internal contradiction. Humour is a battlefield in the relation between these two national Siamese twins, England and Ireland, locked together in a suffocatingly close, often deathly embrace. Uh, there is something about the, I don't know, this is, again, it's, it's, it's a, another context, but, uh, and again, from the, from the, one of the peculiar things from an American context is how issues like, places like Ireland look if you're from this far away. If you're from, from an Anglo-Irish background, you can't distinguish these two cultures. They are locked in a sort of deathly struggle, a sort of macabre dance that's lasted for hundreds of years, uh, which, in a sense, reassures both of them. Now, keeping that example in mind, I want to um, go back to the question of race in the USA and Kara Walker in particular. Now, race, um, the issue which defines this country, the obsession and obscenity that snags at the heart of America's being, as I said a little earlier. Now, the key issue here uh, in, in thinking about race is not diversity or other standard liberal blah, 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 or even multiculturalism, of which the USA, I think, is a poor example. For me, it's about the relationship between whites and blacks, African Americans and Anglos, that has defined the project of this country since the get-go. And I think about that relation uh, in terms of a deathly embrace, fatal to both parties. It's important to grasp that both parties are gripping each other in this embrace, in this peculiar dance, dance macabre, this peculiar macabre dance that leads to misrecognition on both sides. So uh, what I mean by putting it this way is that I think uh, what, I, what I get from Kara Walker's work is you can, you can pick through the superficial cotton candy of diversity talk and uh, pluralism back to the basic um, death-like <laughs> struggle which defines the project of this, this country, which is in terms of a specific racial um, conflict. It goes back, to, goes back to the fact of slavery. And, the, and this leads to misrecognitions on both parts, I think. Let me give you an example. After Hurricane Katrina, the hip-hop star, who I like very much, Kanye West, famously said that George Bush doesn't like black people. Maybe you remember that, that remark. It got a lot of coverage. Now, I think this is part of the fatal misrecognition. Bush likes black people just fine. He loves Condi. He hates poor people. As others have said before, what is most peculiar and disturbing about the issue of race in the USA is the way in which it obliterates the question of class and the issue of socio-economic inequality. This country is full of poor people. Some of them are black, some of them are not. I think race annuls the possibility of forms of political solidarity that would permit the most important question to be faced. The most important question which should be faced is the question of social inequality. And I think race sometimes helps, but often does not. So I think this question of race leads to fatal misrecognitions. That's my main, main point. We can come back to that in discussion, if you like. So to come back to my main theme, humour is what returns us to our locale, to a specific ethos, which is often identified with a particular people or ethnos, possessing a shared set of customs and characteristics. A sense of humour is often what is felt to be best shared with people who are from the same place as us. As it is the, the aspect of social life which is perhaps the most difficult to explain to people from somewhere else. That is to say, humour puts us back in one's place 
in a way that is particular and relative. The point is important because we should not, in my view, shy away from the relativistic nature of humour. When it comes to what makes us laugh, we must, as a teacher of mine uh, many years ago put it, uh, called Frank Chioffi, we must have the courage of our parochialism. The courage of our parochialism. Humour puts us back in place, whether the latter is our neighbourhood, region or nation. Now, it can put us back in our place triumphantly. And this is the most common feature of ethnic humour. The way most, say, racist jokes work is they put oneself back in one's place triumphantly. Um, and most humour is like this. Most humour functions this way. Or again, just on a more uh, general level, the way in which most comedy of recognition works. Most comedy is comedy of recognition. Someone describes or a world is being described and you laugh at it, like the world depicted, say, in, in Friends or something ghastly like that. The, and people are laughing all the time. And we'll come back to this point. I think people should laugh less. <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see that in a second. Now, um, humour, uh, ethnic humour in particular, puts one back in one's place. Uh, and it can put one back in one's place triumphantly, but it need not do this. It might equally put one back in, one, put one back in one's place with the anxiety, difficulty, and indeed shame of where one is from. Perhaps one laughs at jokes that one would rather not laugh at. Nappy-headed whatevers or whatevers, you know. Maybe one is implicated in that. Humour can provide information about oneself that one would rather not have. This goes back to the quotation that Sarah gave. It reminds one that one is, the, one is a person one would rather not be. So what interests me about um, the logic, say, of racist humour is the point at which one stops oneself from laughing, right? That one, as it were, checks oneself. And it's at that point of checking oneself that something is snagging in who you are. I think that's very, very revealing. Um, I could say more about that. So, um, I think what we're seeing when we're looking at, uh, say, Kara Walker's work is a sense of that, that, that shame and our implication in it. We're not outside of it in some sort of lovely, pluralist, multicultural heaven. No, we're still, we're still face down in that, that, that mire. Now, the phenomenon um, that I was just talking about, that one would rather be, a, one is, one, it reveals oneself to be a person one would rather not be, this is revealed in a gap between what one found funny in the past and what one now finds funny. For example, episodes of Monty Python that had me innocently rolling on the floor in prepubescent mirth in the early 1970s and which we, like so many others, laboriously tried to rehearse word for word during lunch breaks at school, now seem to me both curiously outdated, not that funny, and crammed full of rather worrying colonial and sexist assumptions. And the popularity of Monty Python in the United States, in a sense, perplexes me. Because people like it, and I wonder why they like it. It reflects a deeply anachronistic world. Equally, as an eager cosmopolitan, I would rather not be reminded of national differences and national styles. Yet our sense of humour can often unconsciously pull us up short in front of ourselves, showing how prejudices that one would rather not hold can continue to have a grip on one's sense of who one is. One is a person one would rather not be. In this sense, one might say that the very relativity of humour can function as an untimely reminder of who one is. It can write, remind one of the nature of what, to use a little bit of um, philosophical terminology, what uh, the philosopher Heidegger calls thrownness, which I can spell correctly. Two ends. Let's do it in German. Gewaffenheit. Um, the fact that one is, the fact that one is always already thrown into a specific culture, into a specific place. If humour returns us to our locale, then my point is that it can do this in an extremely uncomfortable way, precisely as thrown into something that I did not and would not choose, and yet which is me. I think that's what it means to belong to a culture. 
I did not choose this, it makes me feel shame, and it's me. Right? This is why I think I agree with Thomas Bernhard that hating your country is the condition of possibility for anything like citizenship. Right? So, I think you can only hate the country you're from, and that is the only way, in a sense, of, of having some perverse love for it. Um, if humour tells us you something about who you are, then it might be a reminder that you are not the person you would like to be. As such, the very relativity of humour might be said to contain an indirect appeal that this place stands in need of change. The history is, in Joyce's words, a nightmare from which we are trying to awake. Carol Walker's work reminds us of this nightmare. It is still night in America and I see few signs of rosy-fingered dawn. And this is how I read uh, Kara Walker's silhouettes, the two-dimensional caricatural night in which this country still slumbers. The problem is that there is little reason to wake up. The nightmare is unpleasant, but it's familiar, and it's preferable to a genuine political alternative. I think it suits all parties. That's my more general point. Again, going back to that, um, that I must affair last week, what struck me was how everybody knew what to say. Everybody knew what position to take. It was like a ritual being played out and nothing was done, nothing was changed as a consequence of it, it seems to me. Um, there are issues which are not touched. For example, the issue of um, social inequality. To conclude, a similar point can be made in Freudian terms. I, I make this in the, in the book um, about comedy and repression. In the interpretation of dreams, Freud makes a very perceptive remark about the relation between the comic and repression. He writes, and I quote, he says, evidence finally of the increase in activity which becomes necessary when these primary modes of functioning are inhibited is to be found in the fact that we produce a comic effect that is, a surplus of energy which has to be discharged in laughter. This is the relief theory, right? If we allow these modes of thinking to force their way through into consciousness, end of quote. The claim here is that I pursue a surplus, is that I produce a surplus of energy in laughter to cope with my inhibition when repressed unconscious material threatens to force its way through into consciousness. For example, my tight-lipped refusal to laugh an anti-Semitic or a homophobic joke might well be a symptom of my repressed anti-Semitism or um, homosexuality or whatever. Um, refusing to laugh at, say, a, a Mexican gag might be a symptom of my quiet contempt for Mexicans. So in a sense, the, um, the inhibition of affect is, is revealing. As Freud claims, jokes have a relation to the unconscious. They articulate and reveal a certain economy of psychical expenditure. In this sense, ethnic jokes can be interpreted as symptoms of societal repression and a social and political unconscious. And they can, uh, they can function as a return of the repressed. As such, jokes can be read in terms of who or what a particular society is subordinating, scapegoating, or denigrating. Who can you laugh at in the United States? That's a very interesting question that I've um, pondered. My answer is the Mormons. <laughs> I always defend the Mormons. It's the most fascinatingly complex theology. Um, it's the continuation and fulfillment of the logic of Christianity. I'll tell you a story. <laughs> I was uh, giving a lecture at Brigham Young University, where Dick Cheney was today, at Brigham Young University. I gave three lectures on romanticism. And I began from the premise that uh, God is dead. And we then talked about art and poetry. And it was very nice. It was a wonderful, very, very erudite audience. At the end of the third lecture, a professor of German asked me, he says, your argument about theology begins from the assumption that God is infinite and unitary. I said, yes, it does. God is one and uh, God is eternal. It says, what if God were plural and finite? I said, 
do explain. <laughs> and then we began to get into the idea, the radical idea of incarnation. Josiah Smith was God. Brigham Young was God. There's lots of gods out there in the West. Now, uh, the only people that my students can legitimately feel they laugh at uh, in New York are Mormons. That's very interesting. And uh, so, anyway, I throw that in. <clears throat> I don't think that Carl... Okay, there's a quotation here from Trevor Griffiths. Trevor Griffiths says, A joke that feeds on ignorance starves its audience. A joke that feeds on ignorance starves its audience. I don't think that Carl Walker's work starves its audience. On the contrary, it makes laughter stick in one's throat. Does one laugh at it? How does one laugh? What does one do when faced with this art full of feces, fetuses, fucking, sucking, decapitation body parts, castration, humiliation, and other things that I cannot even say. In I was going to show a slide at this point, which has some very obscene words, but I get embarrassed if I say them. So, uh, the, the piece I'm referring to is a piece from Do You Like Cream in Your Coffee and Chocolate in Your Milk, where she talks about herself as, at the age of 27. When she does that on some of those um, images upstairs, uh, is that funny? I don't think so. And in this, I think, Kara Walker approaches what a philosopher like me would call the essence of humour, which is precisely humour noir, dark humour, black humour, and it's very, very, very noir. In my view, the best humour is not simply funny, it is troubling. The best humour is troubling. The joke that one thought was about the stupid or canny other ends up reflexively rebounding on oneself. In true humour, in great humour, the joke is always on us. I mean, there's very little great humour. Most humour is absolute rubbish because you're laughing at some other or you're simply uh, being reminded of something you recognise. Great humour, the, the humour, say, of, I don't know, the early Marx Brothers films, humour of Lenny Bruce or whatever, is humour which opens you up makes you vulnerable through laughter. And then, so it's as if, I think a great humour is, is, is as if you are being hit by a wave and you're being hit by a wave and knocked over and exposed and vulnerable and you laugh. Right? And then, as it were, the joke's on you. Then you find yourself um, wet on the beach. Um, so in a sense, there's, there's I think the characteristic of, of great humour is in a sense, there is something unfunny at its core. I think this is the deep insight in Kara Walker's remark on the blurb for this lecture about having a, a funny problem with humour, namely that it's not funny. I think the best humour implicates its audience. It grabs hold of us and refuses to let go. Any laughter here sticks in our throats and we begin to choke. I often sit in diners in the US and look at that poster about applying the Heimlich manoeuvre to a choking person. I'll show you the, the poster I mean. Um, I'm sure you also know the meaning of the German term unheimlich, meaning strange, not at home, bizarre, uncanny. It seems to me that Kara's walk, Kara Walker's art produces an unheimlich manoeuvre. We begin to choke and there is no known cure. Funny, isn't it? How then might one respond to this work, this work that simply won't let you off the hook or allow you to feel good about diversity or any other multiculti mouthwash? Perhaps one should not laugh. Perhaps one should smile. This is a suggestion. Not a smile of triumph, but a smile of self-ridicule, of self-mockery and bloody complicity with an obscene past that you might imagine you are through with, but which is not through with you. To quote Magnolia. Perhaps Kara Walker's work might encourage us to understand the noir in human noir, to laugh less and smile more. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Yeah, uh, 
Thank you. I, uh, I appreciated your comment about the uh, sort of Socratic function of humor, uh, humor's uh, ability to reflect to the laugher, yeah. uh, something about that person's self. Uh, can you make more specific what uh, criteria, whether social or individual or cognitive or something else, uh, come to or differentiate those times when people laugh and they leave smugly or with a sense of superiority or uh, mm -hmm. some other sort of happiness, and the times when they then leave with the sense of shame and self-reflection, and, and perhaps even then from the times when that sense of shame and uh, self-recognition leads them to want to do something about themselves or about their yeah. society. There's no criteria. I think that there's no there's no criteria. I mean, I think it's um, it's a muddle, and it, it's um, that's why the you know the beginning from an anthropological starting point is quite important. That you know um, uh, humor is a practice in a society like the one we happen to live in, and by describing it in its thickness and difficulty we can see certain things about it you know in many ways those three theories superiority relief and incongruity could be happening simultaneously in a gag right? or, or um, I could tell you a gag and I would think it's an incongruity gag and you laugh in a sense of superiority or whatever uh, so it's very difficult to get any clarity on this I mean what interests me as uh, I mean, the Socratic function it, it's very interesting to me in the sense in which um, what, uh, what philosophy is about for people like me is philosophy is the calling into question of the prejudices or opinions or common sense of a particular community. Right? And that was what Socrates did. He wandered around, uh, he'd ask people what they thought justice was, and they'd say justice was this, and then he'd show them that justice wasn't that, and then they'd be led onto some sort of quest, some sort of uh, uh, inquiry, path of inquiry. Um, so in a sense, what you're trying to do in philosophy, and philosophy is something which for me has a, has a, has a complete social function, is for people to call into question the dominant prejudices and customs of their, their society. Now, the wonderful thing about humour is that here we have a practice which actually, which actually does that where people are reflective, cognitive spectators on their lives, and they know how to do it. And that's fascinating. So in a sense, um, at its most extreme, I'd say that um, the world seen, seen humorously is something that we do, and it's a place where something like philosophy, as this critical, this critical function of philosophy, actually exists and takes place. And... Um, um, as for sort of sorting out the criteria, it's very, very, just very, very hard. You have to do it case by case, which is a crap answer. Have you got another? Do you want to come back on that? Yeah? Okay. Thank you for the conversation, um, the discussion. I, I've just got a question of, regarding. Um, this idea of humor as it implicates, it's following up on this other question, and, and then the idea of, of America um, being, um, uh, having sort of this duality of black and white versus multicultural. Yeah. And, and the fact that, um, and, and trying to understand or appreciate the, the humor that happens from within. So for instance, the humor that, that, that comes from the outside, let's say racist humor, um, stereotypical humor that that is 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 spoken, but spoken, let's say, to an audience of others um, that yeah. are non-black or non-white or non-Irish <laughs> versus yeah. non-English, versus the Irish or the African Americans having jokes uh, about themselves that mm. that utilize some of the same kinds of stereotypes um, and, and and finding humor in that. I mean, that's is that still implication or is it something else? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, because you've got the, you know, I made a distinction between humour as a form of cultural insider knowledge. So if you and I were from the same t 
town and we then we find ourselves somewhere and then we immediately bond over that there's that insider knowledge and then the, the idea of laughing at some other now that is disrupted by all sorts of examples that the way in which um, um, a, an interesting thing about you know for, ex, for example um, forms of English for, for example um, a show like The Office right The Office with Ricky Gervais which um, when I saw the, the particularly the second series of that the, the original series I mean I couldn't I couldn't watch it um, it was it's too painful it's you know you're, you're hiding behind a, a cushion on, on the sofa because it's just and I mean my steadfast belief at that time was this is radically untranslatable like how would you begin to this is about the specific horror of office life in a specific context and it turns out that that form of real insiderness can be can be spread out in different ways. Or again, the way in which a lot of African-American comics will, uh, like Chris Rock and whatever, will, will move. Um, or again, yeah, I suppose exhibitions like this. I mean, who is the audience of this exhibition? Who is it for? Uh, I don't know what the demographic of the Walker Arts Centre is, but I can probably hazard a guess. Um, and the, you know, and then the, the line at which that becomes voyeuristic, spectatorial, it's very tough. So, um, you, you carry on the conversation, you, 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 you say something else and I'll say something else. <laughs> like, well, again, I, I'm just trying to understand uh, from where you're coming from, I mean, this idea of, of theory, oh. the, the superiority versus relief versus uh, incongruity. I want incongruity. That's, that's my, that's, I think, as it were, great humour is about incongruity. Mm -hmm. that's superiority and relief, I think, are things that go on in humour which I'm less keen on, but they're undeniably there. You know, a sense of triumph over another, and you, know, you can be in, a, in an anxious social context. Or, for example, you are, let's say you're secretly in the closet you know, as, 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 a, as a gay man, um, not you, or <laughs> I am secretly in the closet as a gay man. And, you know, I find myself in a bar laughing too hard at a series of, ho of homophobic jokes, right? That's relief, sort of bumping up against something. So that happened, those two things happen. Incongruity for me is the sublime form of humour. Um, it's the one that really, really interests me. But that was, that was a preface to something. <laughs> and the stuff about... Um, uh, I don't know. I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a foreigner here on a visa, so I've got to watch my words. But the, the, um, um, it seems to me that um, the 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 idea of multiculturalism is an idea which we can talk about. I think there are better and less good examples of it. I don't. This, this is a particularly good example of it. I think Canada would be an entirely different case, and I think that. You can talk about multiculturalism in a German context in a very interesting ways. Very interesting way. I think something else happens in post-colonial cultures, um, uh, like Britain, France, uh, Holland, and by implication the U.S. And I think you need a different map. So in a sense, the um, there is uh, there is a certain source of uh, multicultural talk, diversity talk that I think uh, disavows the historical difficulty that is being faced in a context like this. I think there's something just much more obscene and scandalous which took place. And I think Kara Walker's work is about, is about trying to represent that or evoke that in some way. And um, yeah, that there's, there's a refusal of um, an easy pluralism, it seems to me, in this work. And one is being faced with the difficulty of a basic conflict. And I illustrate that with the, the Anglo-Irish example. Again, you know, the, that's one which I think is, is interesting because, you know, if you look at it genetically or ethnically, you know, nearly 30 million people in the UK can claim Irish ancestry. It's bizarre. You know, how do you, you can't divide these peoples up. How, 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 is it, how is it done? And for hundreds of years, these two cultures have been in, in an asymmetrical, death-like embrace. And it's that basic conflict which defines 
that culture and also gives it life. It gives it enormous vivacity. It produces a Swift or a Stern or a Joyce or a Beckett, you know? Um, and it seems to me that um, something like that is going on here and is being played out in, uh, in the, the art of Kara Walker. And that's just papered over with an idea of uh, easy diversity, you know, which just ends up making white liberals like us feel good. Thank you for that talk, first off. That was very interesting. Thank um, you I especially enjoyed your discussion of German humor because I spent last summer in Germany and uh -huh. it is very unique. <laughs> yeah. um, I remember one day in, in, I was in a, a school for foreigners learning German um, that our teacher decided it would be a good idea to discuss what various stereotypes were in our respective countries, mm. which is uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> and so she started with Germany. And she said, uh, well, she started with, you know, Germans think Americans are fat um, and lazy. Uh, Germans think that Chinese people don't express emotions yeah. and that British people don't have a sense of humor. Apparently, that's the stereotype in Germany. Really? <laughs> yeah. Astonishing. Which I thought was really <laughs> interesting. Um, <laughs> but actually, my question has nothing to do with that. I just wanted to share that. But can, I, can we just cut? Because it, it yeah. it, it's, it's a very, in the, in the, um, in the European context, it's the, the place of German humour is very, very. It's very interesting because um, it's been this uh, constant source of anxiety in in German aesthetic theory and literature for for a couple of hundred years. Then there are exceptions to it, like like Heine, uh, Heinrich Heine, um, um, and in the in the in the book I go into a discussion of George Eliot's essay on Heine, which is brilliant and where she says, uh, I've got it somewhere here actually. She says, um, a German comedy is like a German sentence. You see no reason in its structure why it should ever come to an end. And you accept the conclusion as an arrangement of providence rather than that of the author. And uh, in a sense in which, you know, it's as clumsy as the antics of Leviathan, or laborious and interminable as a Lapland day. Now. But then there's the issue of um, that's complicated. But so there's that deep tradition. Then you overlay that um, with um, how to deal with the uh, the fact of anti-Semitism and the, the memory of the Holocaust and whatever. And it reveal it, it, it leads to some interesting conclusions. So, for example, a philosopher that I'm very keen on, uh, Adorno, um, in his interpretation of Beckett. Um, which is a brilliant interpretation of Beckett, never sees the humour in Beckett. He can't because, in a sense, you can't laugh after, after Auschwitz. In a sense, after Auschwitz, the tears are all dried up. And there's that sense in which, um, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting, very interesting case. Yeah, thanks. Good. But no, but you, you had a question. Uh, but anyway, well. I did have a question. Um, <laughs> Um, which has, doesn't have to do with that. Um, it actually has to do with uh, the fact that when the Kara Walker exhibition leaves here, it's going to the Arc in Paris. And so we'll move to a completely different cultural context. Yeah. Um, and I just kept thinking about that when I was listening to you talk because when I have discussed that fact with my friends, they've all said, well, how can that be? No one in France is going to understand Kara Walker's artwork because... I guess some Americans feel like this is so culturally specific that yeah. how can any foreigner have insight in that? But um, at the same time, I'm wondering if there's an element of like non-verbal humor there, that there is something that transcends cultural context. Yeah, and there are forms. Yeah, I, I, I missed because uh, Sarah told me that that was going to go to Paris, and that was that's what came. We were looking at the um, the uh, the film with the sexual encounter. And we were saying, well, that will have no problem in Paris. <laughs> that, that, that will cause no scandal at all, obviously. Um, which it won't. So the sex won't, I think. But the, and the, but the, the more interesting issue about, about race, that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's interesting. I don't know. I mean, I, I think the, um, the French discourse on race, uh, from a certain perspective, um, 
looks rather good from uh, an American point of view. On the other hand, I think it looks rather bad from... I mean, if, if, if Sarkozy is elected in 10 days' time, as seems likely, and um, he establishes a ministry for immigration and national identity, um, and France is thrown into... Uh, I, I predict fairly, you know, catastrophic and cataclysmic things in France in the next couple of years. I mean, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the fact, I mean, the fact of race in that context has always been covered up by uh, the wallpaper of, multi, of, of republicanism. Right? That one is by virtue of language, essentially, but by virtue of being having been colonised, French, and Frenchness is universal. Frenchness is based on these values which are indiscriminate with regard to skin colour. And, and race takes on a very different feature there. But on the other hand, what went on in the, uh, the banlieue of Paris um, 18 months ago is, is something else. And uh, so, you know, I, th I think the, it's very easy for people in the United States to... Uh, beat themselves up about their past and, and since the lecture was all about that on the other hand um, I think the European context in a sense is much much worse it's defined by um, a completely economically uh, paradoxical uh, 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 anti-immigration movement a return to forms of atavistic nationalism. I think, you know, what happened in particular, I mean, the, the Danish cartoon affair, I mean, that's a very interesting example because that comes out, that doesn't come out of nowhere, that comes out of 20, 30 years of Danish populist politics and if you, that wonderful film Festen, it's the Festen, um, part of the Dogma series where uh, there's the, the black boyfriend of the, uh, the woman who comes to the, the wedding party and they go into this um, Sambo song Danish Sambo song. It's just, it's just agonising. So, I think um, in the in the European context, things are arguably much, much worse. And if there is something to be moderately celebrated in this country, it's uh, it's it's the the way in which immigration has been dealt with, with all the problems that 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 produces in its wake, and all the inequality that it feeds. Right. And um, but um, yeah, don't know where that takes us. But enough. Soapbox standing. There's a question back there. Yeah, I don't have a great way to ask this question, but I was wondering if you could just talk about the phenomenon of the Daily Show and the Colbert Report oh, right. and use your analytic tools there and just flesh uh, out what's going on with that. I think they both, I mean, it, I, I was watching, I, I came to New York in 2004, and, um, you know, it seemed to be that the political, that the role, the task of the political opposition had, had been was being played by the, the roles had been taken on by these shows. The Daily Show in 2004, I thought the Colbert Report was, you know, I thought, I thought did you see the speech that he gave at that, the press, the press dinner? I thought that was, that was a, a supreme comic moment. That was beautiful. I mean, to, to be able to get that close to power and to do that, as it were, in character in a perfectly straight way and to, um, and to be prepared to alienate everybody in the room. I thought it was beautiful. I mean, so that. I mean, I don't think those things have a long shelf life because you know, hopefully, what's happened now is that that political opposition has become part of the actual political process. So, in a sense, um, interesting thing is is the fact that the. Um, um, I mean, hum satire in particular, you know, dark. The darker humour, the better. Works very well in bad times. Right? And in a sense in which um, I've noticed in the last, um, after writing this book on humour, which was written, as it were, in a different period, so pre-9-11, essentially, that um, uh, what people uh, want is some way of celebrating their misery <laughs> and, and being, being uh, reinforced in their pessimism. And satire is a great, a great thing. Right. I mean, you say that it takes on the role of the political opposition. Does it? Is it able to foster meaningful introspection in the way that, say, Kara Walker's work is, or is it still simply playing the same game but on the opposition? No, side? I think it's able to foster. It's able to foster great introspection. I mean, is that? 
and you know it's difficult to um, I don't know I don't know what, in what context you saw say uh, Fahrenheit 9-11 but you know um, I remember seeing that in a theatre in Brooklyn and there was almost it was almost the sense of relief that one had there or not me others had the relief that one could laugh at this this was preposterous and it was being shown how it was preposterous on the basis of an analytical, rational argument, which was also hugely funny. I mean, that, that, um, that liberatory quality of satire, it can't be underestimated. What it does, what its effects are, are unclear. As it were, the movement from fat things like the Colbert Report to actual political change is a difficult one to judge. And the other thing about, you know, about humour... And politics is that uh, I don't think you can, you know, it's not that humour is emancipatory and wonderful. I think, uh, um, I think humour is always politically ambivalent. And if, for example, or just if you think 10 years back, the way in which uh, that same force of satire would have been used by conservatives to undermine. Clinton, right? maybe with the same jokes. And um, the interesting thing about, about humour is often it's the same forms, it's the same jokes uh, given different contents. And um, I, th I think, what would I say? I want to believe that humour has a, a positive political function, but the, uh, the historical register would suggest otherwise. I think it's real... Its real uh, power is enabling human beings to, you know, cognitively, cognitively reflect on their situation and imagine how that situation would be transformed. It can lead into something else. Um, I mean, Swift, for example, Swift was a total reactionary. Right? Often the best satirists are complete reactionaries. Um, so, yeah. uh, I, I guess I, I was going to ask something along those lines what you're just, just talking about. So maybe let's follow up on that. Um, I was thinking of how humor um, can help us uh, make connections between um, our our um, things we care about and political movements, or well. Yeah, I, I guess when when you're talking about how in, in looking at, at Kara Walker's art, um, we we're kind of thrown back on ourselves and yeah. forced to think about uh, the history of slavery and and I, I guess I wasn't sure I, I didn't understand how how that um, uh, self critique can can help us think about how that how we are still implicated in that history of slavery how current, maybe current socioeconomic, socioeconomic inequalities are maybe an, an extension of that history of slavery. Um, and like the, when, when you're talking about the, the Imus affair last week, you're saying that um, the, the news media wa wasn't um, making these connections with socioeconomic conditions, inequalities. And no, it's all about it's all about ethnicity and race. It's all about, it's the love affair with race which defines this country for me. And I find that the most, I'm not, you know, diminishing it, but if, if the, what that leads to is misrecognition of what is the case, then, I mean, so, I mean, the Kanye West uh, quotation, I think it's an interesting quotation because, um, you know, it's heartfelt. You know, you can see what he's getting at, but it's it's the wrong description, right? Uh, what Katrina revealed was uh, uh, massive social um, uh, poverty in this country, which is which affects the black population. But it also, if you look at the statistics on this, affects um, uh, a lot of white people and not other people as well. There's a sense in which you know, it, it, so race can be uh, lead to the love affair with race can lead to misrecognitions on both parts, and it leads to these sort of non-debates. It seems to me, 
as a, an outsider. I guess I was just a little confused then how humor helps us um, recognize this mis misrecognition and get, get beyond discussions of race to reflection on class or socioeconomic inequality. I mean, is it humor itself or humor coupled with some framing in political we, theory or something? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it, to take it into politics, I mean, the, um, I think that... Um, um, you know, uh, first thing, in the the white person that believes themselves free of uh, you know racist humour is is deluded. The sense in which you know that one, and maybe in the future it will change, but you know I can remember laughing at all sorts of things, right, that I'd rather not acknowledge laughing at. And that's a fact about who one is. And it's deep, it's structural. It's culturally structural. And to shift that takes an enormous, uh, an enormous effort. And um, perhaps the effort has been expended, perhaps things have begun, but I don't know. The, to, in a more hopeful mode, uh, in relation to humour and politics, the... Um, my fourth, my forthcoming book <laughs> is, uh, amongst other things, a discussion of a defence of uh, forms of anarchism. And uh, what interests me in particular is the way in which contemporary, what I call neo-anarchist politics, um, in different contexts, uses humour and comedy as a form of uh, political subversion and emancipation. You know whether it's billionaires for Bush or Yabasta or or the Wombleys dressed up in uh, rubber suits or the um, pink fairies on um, bicycles or whatever it may be. Uh, there's something uh, that interests me. So it's because the key thing for me politically is uh, how how one avoids uh, rather the, the key thing for me politically is is strategies of nonviolence, right? Uh, and I, I talk about something I call nonviolent warfare, which is um, very qu very quickly. It seems to me there are three live options politically in the world. This is crude. Three live options politically. The first live option is what I call some other people have called military uh, military neoliberalism. I think that's the, if you're going to bet on anything, bet on military neoliberalism, economic neoliberalism backed up with uh, with guns and missiles. It's powerful stuff. Right? Uh, the second option is, is um, uh, different forms. What I call what I call neo-Leninism. That's to say, neo-Leninist uh, insur violent insurrectionary politics. And under that umbrella, I would uh, I would put Al Qaeda and uh, various other insurgency groups. Say, for example, in Iraq. Right? Uh, the third option for me is what I call neo-anarchism. A neo-anarchism uh, can only distinguish itself as a political position by not resorting to violence. And how does it do that? I mean, that's the question. What, it's, it becomes a question of strategies of non-violent warfare. And we saw that in Seattle. We saw that in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the, the protest before 2001 and, and maybe less so since. And it seems to me that the only... Um, uh, it, what interests me there is the way in which humour has, has, has a... An emancipatory political function, but that could easily be diverted, diluted, and undermined. It's not uh, set in stone. Didn't think I was going to talk about this stuff. I'm sorry. Any last Could you just comment on Borat? To the oh, Borat. Well, again, that's a very interesting example because Sasha, <laughs> uh, Baron Cohen, uh, when 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 because uh, it came out of a show called the Eleven O'clock Show, which was on Channel Four in in Britain in about must have been ninety eight, ninety nine, and it was a bunch of um, unfunny Cambridge educated idiots 
who thought they were funny. There's a lot of people that go to Cambridge think that they're funny because they go to Cambridge and they, you know, Monty Python went to Cambridge, therefore we get our television show too. It was a terribly unfunny thing. Uh, but Sasha Baron Cohen uh, had this uh, three, four minute slot as Ali G. Right? And that's the first time he appeared. And it's interesting, if you, get, if you, can, get, you can get all that stuff on DVD and look at it, the early interviews, uh, the character is there, but it takes a different form. Now, when, um, you know, when I was watching the Ali G thing, uh, I thought this is radically untranslatable, right? particularly into an American context, because you know, it's, a, it's a white boy pretending to be a black boy. Pretending to be, and, it, and, it's, and it's that within... You know, this, the turns of phrase and the language is specifically not even London. They're, they're provincial, aping London. It, it's a very you know specific constellation. Um, so, but it did translate. Barat is different, uh, and the success of Barat I think is very interesting. I was talking to my, I've got some French physicists in LA at the moment, and. Um, I asked them about, about Barat last Sunday and they were saying yeah, it was a huge success in France too. But I imagine it was a success in France because you laugh at Americans, right? And the French love to laugh at Americans. It's part, that's, their, that's their pathology. That's their problem. Um, here it's something, something else. It's, uh, I find it very interesting. I mean, the gags are good. I mean, it's, it's good stuff. I mean, it's... Um, what do you think? I thought it was pretty clever. Uh, uh, just linking it to your... Discussion of ethnicity—it's—it's a—it's a, it's a double, double laughing at. It's laughing at the laughing at yeah. Eastern Europe, yeah, and and sort of you know more primitive forms of modernity. So it's a, it's a which laughing at that, and then that laughing at, and the way in which you know um, Borat will then identify you know, uh, <laughs> U.S. and A. You know. Uh, I love Jew Hunter, Mel Gibson, whatever, and, the, and it's it's that sort of way he will fasten it. it. Yeah, it's deep. I think the um, the uh, the use, of, particularly the, the use of the, the Jewish thing that runs through it, is really yeah, it's interesting stuff. But uh, but I think that's an, that's an example of you know the sort of if you think about that as an example. Okay, um, here we have uh, humour of enormous reflexivity, right? which you could unpick in all sorts of different ways. It, it, you know, it would require a really sophisticated theoretical analysis to analyze that, yet people are in theaters queuing around the block to watch that, and they get it. I mean, that's, that's what interests me about, interest, interest me about, about humor. Um, whether they all get it in the same way, <laughs> what they're getting, but for example, the, um, the thing on YouTube where, you know, um, where he does the throw the Jew down the well, country and western style in Arizona, and you, yeah, and the audience are singing along. It's yeah. <laughs> anyway, God bless Sasha Baron Cohen and all who sail in him. Thank you very much.